On the day that death surrendered to the mighty cross of Jesus Christ, the earth would shake beneath.
Christian Church. Um, for those of you that come here all the time, you might notice that it looks a little different up on stage because today we are doing a young adult youth takeover, so to speak. So we have um, young adults and people from the youth group here um, as the band. My brother Corey is giving the message. We have Maya being the service host and Bryce did the announcement video. Um, so this is all to kind of give the staff members and the volunteers who maybe are up here every Sunday a break and a chance to serve in a different capacity or to just be in the congregation and experience what the rest of us experience on a normal Sunday. So if you would please stand with me, we will get right into worshiping. Stereotype to decide who I am Good morning and welcome to Beaver Creek Christian Church, but more specifically, our young adult and student community takeover of our Sunday morning worship service. My name is Bryce Simpson, one of the young adult volunteers with our student community and usually found in our media room often called the hawk's nest because of our bird's eye view. Usually running the live stream, or more recently, I've been found running around with a Nerf gun during our summer long Nerf war that just came to an end. But enough about me. If you're new here at BCC or just want to reach out with a hello or a question, then scan the QR code here on the screen. 
That's going to let you fill out a connection card or download our church app, which has many other ways for you to connect or view Kids Life, student ministries, and other church resources of all kinds as you go throughout your week. Now on to our actual announcements. First off, we have a couple things happening this afternoon and this evening, as school is about to start. The first thing is our back to school splash that will be tonight from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Bring your lawn chairs, some swimsuits, and towels for the kids while Christy and the Kids Life Ministry will provide the dinner, some tools for you as parents as you help your kids start the school year, and will also be giving your kids the special back to school Sir Thrive Bowl kit. Register on the app or let Christy know you're coming at Christy at BeaverCreekChristian.org. Now our second back to school event happening today is that we are encouraging and asking you to sign up for a school to go and pray for. Maybe it's a school your kids or grandkids go to or just the nearest school to you. It's easy. Sign up on the whiteboard out in the foyer where you want to pray for and grab one of the prayer cards available to give you some ideas of what to pray for. Then head to the school of your choice and pray. Can't do it today? That's okay. Pray for them whenever you're able to. Now I also want to remind you this morning of a couple service projects that we have coming up here at BCC. And the first one is the Popcorn Festival on September 10th and 11th. As we do every year, BCC is hosting the kids area for the Popcorn Festival in the parking lot of the American Legion. Sign-ups to serve in the kids area are now live, so visit beavercreekchristian.org slash popcornfestival or the event on our app to find out more about what we do and what is available to help with. It's an incredibly fun weekend, and we hope that you are able to check out this morning to get signed up for some slots to serve our community. And sign up early, because that's the way you get the best choice of your fun. If you need help with that, or just want to do it right after service, there are a couple of iPads available out in the foyer and someone will be there to help you get signed up. And our second service project is one that we are doing throughout the entire month of August, and that is the collecting and packing of flood buckets for our neighbors in Kentucky. If you haven't heard or seen, there has been mass flooding throughout the eastern part of Kentucky, just a few hours south of us. They have now reached a point in the flooding where they are looking at cleanup efforts and what it is going to take to restore belongings, homes, and lives as the water begins to subside and these buckets will help them do just that. So what we need you to do is grab one of the lists that is out in the foyer and visit beavercreekchristian.org slash floodbuckets. There you will find all the information you need on what to buy and how to pack the bucket. The buckets do pack very tightly, so make sure to check out that website and the video that shows how to do it so that it all fits. Bring the bucket back here to Beaver Creek Christian Church by Sunday, August 28th, because we will be driving them down to Kentucky to a drop-off location where they will be collected and dispersed to those in need. Well, that is all I have this morning. Thank you for listening. And as always, don't forget about all the ways we have to give. There are many exciting things coming up here at BCC, and we couldn't do any of it without your generosity. Thanks again. Now let's get back to the takeover. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do
It's drawing close to back to school season. Some people start next week or in the next couple weeks, and that's all kinds of school, right? Some people are starting for the first time. Some people are starting for the last time, last semester of college. And it's really stressful. It's a stressful time, not only for the students, but for parents and teachers and our schools, too. Um, so we wanted to use this time to pray for back to school. Maybe think about a student in your life or a teacher in your life or just think about a school in particular that you'd like to pray for. And just let's use this time to kind of lift those people up and see if we can't um, help, help alleviate some of that stress because um, God's, there, God's there in it. So go ahead and just take a minute, think about that. Lord, I thank you so much for every person in this room. And I thank you that we can gather together and bring things that stress us out or things that we're excited about to you. And Lord, I pray over this back to school season um, that those who are going in for the first time, um, those who have done this before, maybe it's their last time, that you can help them with all the stresses that this brings. Please help our teachers as they try to prepare a safe and amazing place for students to be able to learn and grow. And God, I pray for our schools and that they can um, facilitate this starting back and that it goes as seamless as possible. And Lord, I just pray for all the students in our church and in our community and that they can see you and that they can know that you're with them as they start on this new journey. And Lord, I pray this all in your name, amen. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good, great. It is a wonderful Sunday, and I'm really happy to be up here today, uh, get to speak to you. I am Corey Gatlin. You may have seen me running around. Um, I just graduated high school this spring, um, and I'm going to Indiana Wesleyan University in just a couple weeks to study sports and exercise science. Um, but yeah, I, um, I'm active upstairs. I've been doing stuff with the tribes upstairs um, and teaching up there. I mean, I really like it, and I like opportunities like this where we get to come together as one group because as this church, we are one tribe. And it's good to have days like this where we bring everybody together because it shows us upstairs what it's like down here, but it also gets to show you guys down here how we roll upstairs. Um, so opportunities like this are just great. I love it, um, and it's really an honor for me that I get to speak today. Um, but I love teaching upstairs, and one of the reasons that I love teaching upstairs is because I just love history. I'm a big history nerd. Um, none of it's useful. It's all random facts about random eras um, anywhere. It's not helpful, um, but I find opportunities to give my random facts any, anywhere possible, even if it's not remotely related to what I'm talking about or what anyone else is talking about. Um, but that's what I like to do. Um, and I've loved history so much. A few years ago, um, more than a few, I volunteered at Carillon Historical Park. I was a historical interpreter. Here is the picture of me on my first day. <laughs> the braces are actually historically accurate. Um, but yeah, I was in their 1800s kind of area. So I volunteered at um, the Shaker House or at the William Morris House, um, and it was really fun. So if I was at the Shaker House, um, I was normally kind of in the back as this apprentice kind of, so I'd be working with their woodworker or with their blacksmith, kind of helping him out, doing different stuff for uh, the guy that was working. Um, and that was really cool. Or I would be in the William Morris House, which is kind of this one-room stone house from the early 1800s with a, a garden in the back and a summer kitchen. And so I'd be in the, in the house normally, working with whoever was in there. Normally there was some lady cooking. And so I would be helping bake bread or, you know, make some sort of stew or something. I churned a lot of butter. I churned a lot of, I would just sit there, you know, churning butter. It was, it was what you had to do. But my favorite days were we'd have large school groups come, and they would come and, 
and we'd just kind of set up some extra stuff so I would get to be out in front of that William Morris house with the time period toys. Um, and so, you know, the good old hoop and stick. Um, my favorite was I got to walk around on stilts most of the day. We had this, like, kind of old 1800-style stilts that I got to stand up on and talk to people on. It was, it was fun. But I really loved it. I loved teaching at Carillon. I loved being a part of that. Um, and I really liked that we all had our own point of view on history. So we all had our own perspective on history. And I even got to have multiple different perspectives. You know, the boy in the house doing chores, you know, the, the, the kid having fun, an apprentice to some tradesman. But then you had, you know, the men who were working and, and you had their perspective on it. You had the women who kept everything in shape and made all sorts of yummy foods. My favorite was our ice cream. Um, but we all had our own perspective to add to the time period. And so when people came and they learned from us, it was our job to present our point of view good or bad, we were telling it what it was like for us. And that point of view is really important. And I've learned that point of view is really important, obviously with people. When you're, when you're talking to someone, understanding your own point of view is good. Understanding other people's point of view and perspective is good. And so point of view is important in just our general life. But it's also important when you're looking at the Bible. When you're reading, when you're studying a passage or a chapter, understanding your point of view and how you approach that is important so that you can understand other people's point of view and how they're approaching the Bible. But you also need to know the Bible is full of points of view, right? It is this, it is this ancient book spanning hundreds and hundreds and, and hundreds of years, and the people who write it have their own point of view. So if you're looking at the Old Testament, you have all these stories from, you know, creation to Joseph to the kings and the prophets, and they're written by someone. Now, I believe that it is this fully inspired work from God and that his words are through it and his power is through the Bible, but there's still an author writing it, and his point of view and his perspective will seep through a little bit. And that's not bad, but when you're reading a lot of the Old Testament, you'll read a story like Joseph, and you get that one author who wrote the story of Joseph. It even happens in the New Testament. So like if you're looking at the letters of Paul, you get Paul's perspective on what's happening. Now it's from God, and, and he may be talking about a different situation or to a different group of people about something different, but it's Paul who's writing to them. However, there is one part of the Bible, it's a fairly important part of the Bible, you probably all know it, where we get four different people's perspectives on one story. Those are the Gospels. Fairly important, right? The story of Jesus, right? It is this life and this context of Jesus, and it is the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, um, there's a lot cool about the Gospels, and I really like how we get these four perspectives, because all of these people come from different backstories, they have different perspectives on Jesus, who he is, what kind of guy he is, um, and they have their own perspective of the life they led, where they come from, and who they're trying to write for. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, only two of which were, only, were original 12 disciples, Matthew and John. Both uh, Mark and Luke were kind of disciples of Paul, and pretty strong Christians. Um, Luke is kind of famously this doctor who gathered as much accounts of Jesus as he could. He got testimonies from people who lived and spent time with Jesus, and he compiled all of his documents to create as accurate a story of Jesus' life as possible. And he wanted to show that Jesus was human. So Luke is this doctor who wants to have this detailed account of a person's life. That makes sense, right? If you're this, this person of science, you want to have a detailed account. You want to show that Jesus is human. You want to be a part of that. Luke was also the only, um, he was the only known Gentile to write a book in the New Testament. Um, he was a Greek uh, Christian, so a Gentile. And then you have Mark. Mark was also a disciple of Paul, spent some time in Paul's early life working with churches. Um, and he wrote his gospel for the Roman Christians. He wanted to give this work of Jesus. So his, his gospel is mostly, it's, it's this kind of general view of Jesus. It's his life, his works, what he's done, and it's aimed at this specific audience that, that Mark wants to reach. And that's his gospel. And then you get to Matthew. He's the first gospel. He was one of the 12. Matthew, the tax collector. So he was probably not liked very much when he first became a disciple because he's the guy that no one liked. But Matthew was a smart person and he was a Jew. So his gospel is written towards the Jews and, and he brings in a lot of Old Testament prophecy connected to Jesus. And so his his purpose for writing his gospel was to conclusively prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And so, so, so Matthew writes this kind of detailed account of showing how Old Testament relates to Jesus and how he is our guy. So he wrote for the Jewish people trying to show, hey, this is the Messiah that was prophesied. And then you have John. 
John wrote a very different gospel. I have a funny picture here. It's Tiger Woods and John Daly. Tiger Woods being the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John Daly being the gospel of John, the crazy thing who's just not related to the rest at all. And this is, you know, this is funny, and it's a little bit accurate. John wrote a completely different gospel from any of the other three. You, you lack a lot of the main stories. In John, we don't find any of the birth or the childhood. You don't get a genealogy. You don't get Jesus' temptation. You don't get most of the parables. Like, you hardly see a lot of the stories that are just consistent throughout the first three gospels. And so it's weird because John wrote a different gospel. John had this super close personal relationship with Jesus. And so when John decided to write his book, he wanted to show that relationship that he had with Jesus. He wanted to show that personal connection that he had with Jesus, not just the story, but who Jesus is to John. And that was his purpose. His purpose for writing his gospel was to conclusively prove that Jesus is the way to God. John 14, 6 is the famous verse. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John. John is showing this side of Jesus. He is holy. He is perfect. Let's learn from him. Right? He, he is the way. And all of this is really cool. Right? We learn a lot from all of this. And it's, it's neat to understand the differences in the Gospels, to understand how they were written differently, the background of the people who wrote them, the lives that were lived, who they wrote it for. It's cool stuff, right? It's, it's neat to know the context and the history to that. But how do we use that? How is that helpful? Well, to, to kind of look at that, I want to read um, or go over one of the stories, one of the very few stories, there's only a few of them, only a couple, that appear in all four Gospels. And it's the same story in all four Gospels. And this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And so um, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of how it goes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, I figured you guys didn't want to listen here and have me read four different sections of a story. Um, so I'll give you the quick version of how it goes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's very similar. There's, you know, plus or minus a few words, but they all read pretty much the same. And it goes a little bit like this. Jesus withdraws from a crowd onto a boat with his disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee to find some rest, to find some food. Now the crowd sees this, and they follow around on foot. And so once Jesus has landed, he sees this large crowd ready to greet him. And all of the Gospels, all three of them say this. They say that when he sees the crowd, he was compassionate. And he preaches to them, and he heals their sick. And I want to pause there, because that is Jesus, right? Jesus is just trying to find rest. He's just trying to find a quiet time. But he sees this large crowd who's there for him. And instead of being annoyed and being like, oh, will they go away? He instantly is ready to love them, ready to heal them, ready to preach to them and teach them. That's Jesus. He's instantly loving as soon as he sees this crowd. He's ready to be their grace and truth. And then after he preaches and he heals for a little while, the disciples come to Jesus and they're like, hey, it's getting late. The people are getting hungry. You should send them off to go to nearby villages and towns because where we are is pretty remote. They need to go find some food. And in all three of the Gospels, once again, Jesus says this. Maybe there's a few added words, but it's all this. You give them something to eat. And this throws the disciples off guard. In some of the Gospels, it says that they kind of respond with, you expect us to afford that? That would cost so much money. We can't do that. And in some of the Gospels, they're kind of just like, "Uh, what do you mean? We don't have enough food. Like, what are we supposed to do? And so Jesus is like, "Uh, you you should know this by now. So he sends them to go find what food they have, and they come back with the famous five loaves of bread and the two fish. And in all of the Gospels, it says that he takes it, he looks up to heaven, he gives thanks for the food, he breaks the bread, and he hands it out to his disciples. And then he does the same with the fish, and he hands that out to the disciples, and then they disperse it. And after everyone has eaten their full, Jesus instructs the disciples to go pick up the leftover baskets, pick up as much food as they can left over, let nothing be wasted. And they come with 12 baskets full of leftovers, more food than they started with. And so this is that miracle. This is, this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's very cool. It's this awesome miracle. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in there about um, the Old Testament and also, you know, all sorts of numbers. The Bible's full of important numbers. But it's all right there. And that is kind of that story, how it goes. And now I'm going to read John with you guys. It is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. I'll have it up here. It goes like this. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, 
that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will, it, will, will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So that is John's version, and it's fairly different. Now, we, he doesn't, you know, skip the story entirely. He tells the story of the feeding the 5,000, but he adds in so much more detail in there. That whole conversation with Jesus and his disciples is new. And, and, you know, John names names about what happened. John shows this conversation that Jesus had. It's the most, you know, words that Jesus has in any of those four stories. And John does this in a different way. He's showing Jesus' love, but he's showing this personal relationship that Jesus had with the disciples. He's showing this kind of teaching moment that he had. And, and we see kind of clearly that John recognizes that Jesus is teaching. We see probably in some hindsight right here when it says that he asked this only to test him. He already had in mind what he was going to do. John learned from that. He sees how Jesus has taught the disciples. He sees how Jesus is trying to teach him. And he recognized that. And because that's impactful to him, because John's gospel is about Jesus to him, that's what he writes in his story. He's writing this personal connection that Jesus had. He's writing how Jesus interacted with him as a disciple and with his, his other disciples around him. Because Jesus here, he's, he's, he still gets to the point where he gives compassion to the, to the, you know, the, the crowd of 5,000. We see that. You know, he still tells that. But he also takes the time to interact with his disciples. He, in, he takes the time to love them, and, G, and John recognizes that and shows that love. He presents that love in his book. And that is who Jesus is. If we look at Jesus through all the Gospels and what they're trying to say who he is, whether they're writing to a different audience or trying to portray him in a way, you know, show how he is human or show how he is holy, the Messiah, all of them focus on that one central point, that Jesus is loving Right? As soon as Jesus interacts with someone, he's loving. That's the first thing he does. In, in the other three Gospels, they hit that too. They hit that mark right square on the head when it talks about how as soon as he sees this crowd, he's compassionate. He heals them and he teaches them. He's instantly loving to all of those people. And in John's, he's instantly loving to the disciples when he sees this teaching moment. He's instantly ready to, to help them grow, to help them learn, to show them that that he is powerful and that they can kind of learn from that and grow from that. And so all of the Gospels show that Jesus is love, and John's Gospel just shows that his love is personal to John, because that's what John felt. So if we're looking at Jesus' love, John's Gospel shows Jesus' love so well because it's this firsthand account of how someone was loved by Jesus in person. I wear this wristband every day as a reminder to me um, it has two acronyms on it, one of which we all probably know. The first is WWJD, which stands for What Would Jesus Do? So that's right here. What would Jesus do? And it's meant as this kind of this reminder for you if you're in a tough situation or if you're in a tough spot. It's supposed to be this question you ask yourself. What would Jesus do? How would he handle this situation? What would he say? What would he do? And you base your response off of that. Because as a Christian, our goal is to be like Jesus. So we should ask, what would Jesus do? It should be kind of this constant, this constant thought in our life. The other acronym some of you may, knew, may know, many of you may not, is HWLF. And this is meant to be the response to what would Jesus do. This is meant to be the answer to what he would do in any situation. 
And HWLF stands for He Would Love First. And while it's this good reminder to me, and it just kind of it sits here, and it's this company that makes some really cool uh, Jesus merch, um, it's also, I think it's true. Because if you look at Jesus, and you look at how he interacts with the people around him, the disciples, the crowds, if you see how he interacts with Pharisees and sinners, murderers, beggars on the side of the road, none of it is, you're doing it wrong. It's always, I love you, you're doing this, but how can I help you get better? Jesus is instantly love in any situation that he's in. What would Jesus do? He would love first. So that's, that's why where that is a reminder is if I'm trying to be like Jesus and I'm asking myself, hey, what would he do? He would love. What should I do? I should love. Jesus would love first. John in his gospel shows that personal love that Jesus had and that connection that Jesus had with the disciples. And John calls himself um, the one who Jesus loved. Throughout his gospel, he, he kind of talks in third person, describing himself as the one who Jesus loved. And at first glance, that seems a little like, oh, 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 Jesus loves you, right? Like, it's like, oh, I'm so braggy. Jesus loves me. But he's not wrong, is he? Jesus loved John. The catch is that we are all the one who Jesus loves. Jesus loves every single one of us. We can all call ourselves the one who Jesus loves because it's true. We see that throughout the gospel. Like I just said, when he interacts with anyone, it's through love, because he loves that person. That's why John's gospel is, is weird and different. And not that the other gospels get it wrong, but when we talk about this concept of living history, and we're looking at the story of the Bible and how it connects to our day-to-day -day lives, and we're looking at Jesus, Jesus connects to us through love not just this long history of stuff, but the day-to-day -day actions that Jesus performed with the people he was close to. Jesus is love. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked by the teachers of the law, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus responds, they're trying to trick him, they're trying to get him to, to say something, and they're like, oh, but they're all equal. But Jesus responds to them. He doesn't ask them a question, he answers a question. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus just boiled down every single law, every single teaching from every single prophet in the Old Testament, this law of God, you know, 600-something laws. He boils it down to two simple commandments. Love your God and love your neighbor. That is who Jesus is. That is what he preaches to the world. He preaches this message of love your neighbor and love God. We learned from my dad week one. We talked about the creation story. We talked about how we are all this image of God. We are all created in this image of God. So if our instructions are love God and love your neighbor, that's pretty close to one and the same. If I'm loving you, I'm loving God because you are a part of God. Because I believe every day that God loves me and that I was created in his image. I believe that. And so if I'm interacting with the people around me and someone frustrates me, I just have, I, they are a part of God as much as I am. I am no more special than anyone else around me. They are God just like I am. So if I'm supposed to love my neighbor like I love God or like I love myself, love your neighbor as yourself. If I'm a part of God and I love God, I love that neighbor equally. There's no greatness. There's no worse Everyone is equal. Everyone is a part of God. Everyone deserves that love that Jesus gave. So Jesus' whole message is to love. He boils down all the laws to love. Love your God and love your neighbor. Jesus is that example his whole life. He is an example of love. He's an example in how he talks, what he does, the situations he's in. Every single moment of his life, he examples love perfectly. And his one request to us is that we accept the forgiveness that he gave us, dying on the cross for our sins, to accept that, to live that out, and to change our whole perspective on life to one of loving first. Because what would Jesus do? Jesus would love first. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? 
Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to teach about your son today. Thank you for all the teachings that he is in the New Testament. Thank you for his message of love, God, because it is one true message that we should learn from. I thank you for that. I thank you for, for his love and his graciousness, his compassion instantly for all of us. God's love is, is pure. And once we accept that love, we let it emulate through our bodies. It is perfect love. I pray that as we go out into our lives and into our weeks that we try and be the love that Jesus wants us to be. I pray this in your wonderful and holy name, and I worship you, God. Amen. communion every week as this reminder of Jesus' love, this reminder of the sacrifice that was made for us so that we can accept the forgiveness and live our life just like Jesus would, loving first. We take 
the, the bread as the sign of Jesus' broken body on the cross. And we, we take the blood as the juice is the blood, which represents that sacrifice, and that holiness, the purity of Jesus. Today, when, when you take your communion and you take your bread before you drink, before you eat, I want you to, to say your thanks. And just like Jesus did, as he exampled throughout the Bible, take your piece of bread, break it, symbolizing his broken body. Break it like he did in our story today, like he did on the Passover night. Break the bread, take it, take the juice. His sacrifice is worth it as long as you love first. Take and eat. joy that Jesus gave his life for us so that we could be free of sin. And if you know me, you know I love a good jumping song. So there's some jumping parts in this last song, and if you are willing and able, I invite you to jump with me. So let's sing our last song.
What's up? Thank you everybody so much for being here. Um, if you need prayer of any kind, we really want to invite you right over to this room. We've got some people with some orange lanyards on who would love to pray with you. So please, by all means, stop on over there. And if this is your first time here, thank you so much for being here. We have a trailhead right at the uh, back of uh, the room over here and you guys can get a gift from us as a thank you for coming in. I just wanted to close us out in prayer as we go off. God, I thank you again so much for every person who's joined us today, and I thank you that we can come before you and we can jump and sing and praise you. And Lord, I just pray that um, we can be your hands and feet in the world this week, that we can take that love that you give us and give it out to our communities and to our families and to the people who love us. And Lord, I just pray that you can give us that joy and the patience to be able to see you and love you as we move and breathe in this week. And God, I thank you again. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for being here.